Okay? So the topic is creating thought leaders in the new learning organization. So there's a couple of terms there. We'll hit them one at a time about exactly what that means. It, uh, it's one of the models that, that uh, comes out of my book. My book is called The Explanation Age. How many of you have heard of the term information age? Everyone's heard of that, right? Well, what was the point of the information age? That we would all have ubiquitous access to information. Does anyone have one of these? So we can check that off now, right? Check, we've got that. What is the next thing, really, that we're working towards? That's the sort of topics that I talk about. And one of them has to do with thought leaders. To hit this topic, I want to make sure we talk about the definition for a second. What is a thought leader? If we look at this definition, intellectual influence, innovative or pioneering thinking is one of the definitions I usually use. It begs this question as soon as we hear that, does that sound like an expert? Is a thought leader the same as an expert when I hear the term expert? What do you think when you see this definition? Uh, that's a great uh, uh, contrast, expert in what is known versus coming up with something new. Any, any other thoughts on this? Yes? The word influence also distinguishes. So you have experts that don't necessarily influence. That don't necessarily influence. So there's a lot of, it's a short definition, but each one of those words you could think about and, and show there's, it's a little bit different than the way that we think about an expert. So this is why... I say this, this is one of the quotes in my book. If you're just an expert, your job is about to be outsourced or embedded in a microchip. Okay? So we really should understand the difference between these things and think about how the organization is developing thought leaders. Okay, so the topics today creating thought leadership on five principles. One, teams work in learning organizations. Two, leaders separate dialogue from directives. Three, individuals operate within double loop learning. Four, the culture encourages questioning skills. And finally, the organization supports all four learner types. Okay, so these are strategies or principles that I'll be hitting for five key ones, and uh, we'll hit them one at a time. So this first one, teams work in learning organizations. Let's talk about this term learning organization for a second. One of the things you saw in the title, I talk about the new learning organization. What does that mean and why do we need a, a new learning organization? Well, let's talk about the difference between how I, I use these two terms. So a learning organization, at least de defined by uh, Peter Senge in his book, Fifth Discipline, uh, several decades ago, was that if you want to be one, in other words, you're not already one. But if you want to be one, here's what you need to do. You need to master five disciplines, okay? Systems thinking, mental models, personal mastery, team learning, and shared vision, if you want to do that. And after several decades, someone went up to Peter Singh and said, everything you describe about a learning organization sounds fantastic. I have a question for you. Where, where are they? Where are all the learning organizations? How come no one is signing up to do this. We can't find one. And so uh, I really respect his answer. This is almost a quote in reflecting and thinking about it. And he says that uh, there are few learning organizations mainly because people see learning as an add-on to their work. So I'm doing my work. I don't have time to stop and learn. I might have it in my schedule. I've signed it for three classes to take this year because that's learning. But then I have to get back to work. And I looked at this, and I, and I realized that part of the problem was in the definition statement itself. In other words, if you want to be a learning organization, go do that. It's different than working. So it was, it was uh, built into the definition. So the way I describe a learning organization is really different. I mean, when you study an organization, one of the things you realize, the, the things they struggle with, the things they're trying to do, they're already a learning organization. They just have a lot of learning disabilities. It's different than saying, do you want to be one, than to say you are one, you just don't realize it. That's what you're struggling with is that you don't realize 
that that's what you are and uh, the disabilities you have in trying to reach that. So what does that mean? The workforce of the future will operate from new business slash learning models combined, not business models, learning models. It's the same thing. By developing knowledge workers into knowledge leaders, let's stop on that point. How many decades have we talked about knowledge workers? And I've always asked, where are the knowledge leaders? Because they seem to be taking the same classes that came out of World War II. And we need to be developing the knowledge, knowledge workers into knowledge leaders. Another topic, I think I talked on that a year ago. And experts into thought leaders. That's the topic for today. Why do we stop at expertise when what we really need are thought leaders? So a little bit different way of describing it and uh, really uh, the definition and the terms I, that I use and why we need to move to a, a, a thinking of a new learning organization. So with this definition of learning organization, the question is, is it just one person going through this or is it multiple people? And I do like this quote, uh, another one from Peter Singer. He says, Leaders of change without partners are not only blind, they are dangerous to themselves, to others, and to their dreams. So the question here is, do thought leaders work with other partners? Now, I always use someone that you've maybe thought of, if you, have, uh, if you happen to have an iPhone. So who do we think of when we think of Apple? the person that was out front inventing all of this stuff. So everyone has the same answer, Steve Jobs. But in the early days, did Steve Jobs have a learning partner, someone that he bounced ideas off of? What was his name? That's a, that's a funny answer, but that's a good answer. He actually did have conversations with Bill Gates. But you're right, Wozniak is a person that we don't, we don't use his name as much, but certainly right there in the garage when they're comparing notes. And, and uh, you want to have someone that's a, a trusted partner, someone you want to bounce an idea off of that every once in a while that was a really crazy idea, that it's a trusted relationship that that person doesn't run out and say, you're not going to believe what Steve said. That, I mean, he's brilliant and comes up with ideas. That was the craziest thing. So you want a sounding board. You want to have a a learning partner that, that you can trust. And so the first question I have for this group is, who's your learning partner? Do you have one? Because if you don't, then this, this is going to be one of the things that stops you or your organization uh, from developing uh, thought leadership, OK? So quickly then, uh, as a quick summary of this section, one of the, the five uh, strategies is uh, thought leadership requires intellectual influence, innovative or pioneer thinking. The new learning organization performs work from new learning models, and learning partners are essential in reaching thought leadership. Let's hit the next of the, the five key principles. This one says, leaders separate dialogue from directives. So if you ask people what this term means, dialogue, you hear a bunch of words. I want to see what you think of this term. If I say to you, dialogue, what does that word mean to you? What are some synonyms that you would use? Conversation. Conversation that's a good one. Exchange. Exchange. Give and take. Give and take. These are really good. Two-way. Two -way. Really good. These, these are all excellent. I should put them up here. Um, What's the, what's the thing about dialogue that you like? Learning. Learning. learning something from somebody else or, someone else or the shared group. Learning is a key part of it. Okay. Um, Reciprocity. 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 Even bigger words. Okay. Good. I like all of these. These are really good examples. But I'd like you to compare that to this term, directive, and tell me how that word feels. What are some synonyms you use for that word? One way, so a different level. Suppression. Pardon me? Uninclusive, mandate. Instructions, do this, yes. I heard another one. Force. Force? 
for us. Sure, absolutely. Feels a lot different, doesn't it? It has a whole different emotional feel to it. Uh, which one you like better? <laughs> Let's just get rid of this one, right? Can you have only one, or do you need both? Oh, oh yeah. Wow, everyone in unison, we need both. Okay, and we actually do. And you see that in conversations, and you'll see it in projects where there's a point in time where the leadership is saying, I want to get your input. I really want the ideas, okay? And there's a point in time when they say, I've heard enough, and here's what we're going to do, okay? Now, the problem is if you want a culture that's building thought leadership, you cannot be confusing around when that point in time happens, okay? So being clear about when you're giving dialogue versus directive is, is important. So here's an example. So the leader says, hey, I have an idea. What do you think of it? And you're thinking, uh, okay, I'll get right on that. Because you're, you're thinking, obviously, they want me to do that. Because uh, I, they don't want to hear me say that's probably not the best idea. So there's some confusion around the point in time that the leader is actually wanting to engage in dialogue and wanting to say, hey, you know, what do you think of this? And you're like, well, they must want me to do it. So, and I'm off doing it. Okay? And if you're the leader, you're like, hey, where'd you go? I, I just wanted to talk. We're not ready to, to jump into that. And there's usually some confusion around when this happens if, if leadership is not very clear about when they're uh, communicating which forum that they're in. If the leader is always seen as just providing directives, you may have had that leader somewhere in your career, right? That's all they do. Here's what I want you to do. The organization will simply shut down and not feel it's safe to offer ideas. Raise your hand if you've ever worked in that organization. You ever seen a place like that? It's just, I'm going to tell you the answer. Here's what it is. And I might ask you, but here's what we're going to do. And what, what's the effect on the culture in the organization? It starts to shut down. Because why bother, right? So what it means is if the leader asks for feedback on an idea and you offer an alternative, and then get shut down or even later feel that, that maybe there's some retaliation because later on you maybe had a different idea during the meeting. The organization, same language, will simply shut down. So here's what we're fighting against. Fear of insubordination hurts the development of a learning culture and it has to be managed by the leadership. Now one of the, one of the examples I, I give in my book is, is this, is that uh, some of you uh, may have worked in organizations where uh, the information that you share in a meeting sometimes is classified and sometimes it's unclassified. And being, and being very important and being very clear about which it is, organizations make up very fancy signs. Some of them have lights, classified, unclassified. It's like we have to know that which one is it. And, I, and what I say is that it is exactly that important. And now I don't mean to you know, run out and make a sign, but it's, it's in that important to say, which one are we in? Because if we're not clear, uh, these other things start to happen. So this, uh, this exercise, I call it Shout It Out. It's going to uh, ask you a question. Determine if a dialogue or directive, OK? So when you see one, just shout it out which one you think this is. Help me out. I would like to get your thoughts before finalizing this policy. Dialogue. Dialogue, okay. Even though it's about a policy. Okay, good. Please send that email out today. It's, even though it says please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just to be nice. It's, get, get it done, right? Okay, good. How about this one? Let's schedule a meeting to roll out the new plan. A directive. How about this one? Let's schedule an off-site to brainstorm ideas. OK. Now, maybe you would probably want to schedule these two in, a, in an opposite order, right? As a way of separating the two, sometimes leadership is that clear about it, is that you're not even going to have the two happen in the same meeting. You have an off-site, get some ideas, and then next week, we'll come back together and say, I've heard enough. 
here's what we're going to do, just to make it very clear. But this is a topic that we don't talk about enough. It just sort of happens as part of the exchange. It might even happen in the same sentence or with the same breath when you're talking to someone. I've got an idea. What do you think? Okay, well, then we'll do this. I mean, you can run it together. But if we're not clear about when we're switching gears, it can affect uh, the learning culture. So a quick summary in this section. A dialogue uh, is a form for sharing ideas. Directive is a form for giving and taking orders. And we need to be clear. You're not going to have one or the other. So uh, we need to be clear about which one we're in. OK, we're already up to number three. Individuals operate within double loop learning. How many of you are familiar with this term double loop learning? Most of us? Most of us? OK, good. Uh, real important concept if you've uh, looked at double loop learning. It's been around for a few decades. If you Google it, it looks like this. Single loop, double loop. What are, what are the things that it's connecting? So here's a consequence. Here's something that's happening. Here's an outcome, an output. And we want to look at that and say, all right, what do we do about it? So a single loop idea might, oh, let's just change a little bit and see what happens, or do it a little faster. Uh, Eventually, we're going to say, you know, none of this is working. Maybe we're thinking about this entirely wrong. So we'll come back to what's called double loop learning and start to understand what are the governing variables? What are the underlying mental models that's driving our thinking? So you may have heard these terms, mental model or the paradigm. The paradigm is the, uh, is the operating model that you're operating from. So you've heard of the term paradigm shift. That's what this is about when you finally go, we're going to think about this entirely differently. Uh, or algorithm or, or axiom in math is the fundamental thing that's driving your thinking. Or sometimes people will say, you know what, uh, we're chopping the trees down and the axe has gotten dull, so it's time to stop and sharpen the axe and then go back again. Well, sometimes in our organizations it's time to stop and invent a chainsaw. And you mentioned, uh, we heard this earlier in, uh, in the previous presentation. There's sometimes there's layoffs. Sometimes the organization's going in another direction. There's always change. So the question is, are we getting left behind because we're still sitting here in our single loop thinking? We know how to do our job, but the organization is moving on to another bigger thing. And are we part of that and able to keep up? Or more importantly, are we the thought leader that's driving that newer, bigger change? Are we uh, thought leaders or just knowers of our current job? So one way to be sort of safe is to make sure we're not a knower, but we're a learner. And that's what double loop learning shows us, that the, that the people in the organization need to be thinking about how their work fits into this model. How much of your work is, I've been trained to do this, and I know how to do it. And how much of your work is, I understand why, and I'm thinking about maybe some different ways to do it. Here's an example I usually give with uh, HR. And uh, they don't like it, but so HR can say, you know what, uh, how can I clarify the consequences of tardiness because uh, this is about people coming in to work late? Well, uh, how can we hire better employees because that must be it. People are coming in to work late. Or maybe, maybe what the HR people do in some cases is say, wait a minute, maybe I need to think about this completely differently. Why are some coming in tardy and some not? There's something about them I need to understand. Or maybe, why do I specify, time, specify the times and monitor tardiness anyway? This isn't the industrial age. It's not a factory. Here's your job right here and your station and you need to be there. Some people are doing jobs that are more creative. Some people are more creative at night. Some people, they have their laptops anyway. Why do we still have this fixed thinking in place? So it's the type of thing that you can do with any job. Uh, if you can do it with HR, right? There's really sort of st step back and question the model that's driving your thinking. So that's double loop learning. Oh, good. Another shout it out. Are you ready? This one is um, determine if using single or double loop thinking. Go ahead and shout one out or the other. If it gets hot, just turn on the air conditioner. Single. Okay, good. Single. This is how we have always done it. Single. There has got to be a better way. Double. double. What if cars could drive themselves? Double. OK, good. So you get the idea. And uh, you know, when we think about changing the model, the way we're thinking about it, 
This is a, this is a guy who, uh, you know, who looked at, at his time, uh, Vincent van Gogh, uh, the way that we thought about painting, the way we thought about drawing, and said, why is it we have to think about it that way? Uh, and completely changed uh, the way that, that art was done from that, from that time. Uh, some of the most expensive paintings that's ever been sold. Um, I'm not sure why, that's another topic. But he has a great quote that I, that I like on this. He says, do not quench your inspiration and your imagination. Do not become the slave of your model. And I like this term because we become the slave of our model when we don't even know what it is. And we're not even sure, we're just doing, we've just tr been trained to do something. Here's what we're doing. And we haven't had time to reflect and question and go back and say, what's governing this? What are the models that drive this? And maybe we should change those models and operate under another model. Part of the problem is our education system. We're, we're living with an education system that was built for the industrial age and it's still putting out people that are perfectly qualified for the industrial age. Here's how we train you. Can you memorize this? You're a good knower, uh, but they don't develop you into being learners. Now, when we change the model, what happens is people say, I don't know if I, if I can do that. I mean, I know you mentioned Steve Jobs, okay, but I, I'm not Steve Jobs. I can't just go come up with a whole new model and, and be a thought leader. How do you start? How do you start in, in this area? And in the innova innovation space, uh, there's terms that are used that are called red ocean and blue ocean. How many of you are familiar with, with those terms, red ocean and blue ocean? Okay, good. So uh, I forgot to warn you, there's some graphic material here. You see, the reason it's called red ocean is swimming with the sharks. Um, what does that mean? Well, anyone can sort of jump in and start to compete with what's there, but it, it's, uh, it can be dangerous. There's people already in that space, right? But what it looks like is swimming with sharks means, you know, you're fighting with the competition, making value cost trade-offs, compete in the existing market space. And you can start there uh, and then work your way towards what's called the blue ocean or open waters, where you finally realize there's a way you can think about it, that you create uncontested market space, play with an unfair advantage, okay? Here's an example that I call from paper clips to post-it notes. Okay, now, before the paper clip was invented, there were other ways to uh, put two pieces of paper together. Uh, you remember sort of ripping them and a couple rips and bending. And, uh, and then if, if it's always two pieces of paper, you know, a stapler came along. But this paper clip was out there as an idea that people would use. So after a while, okay, someone came along with an idea and said, you know what, I'm going to swim with the sharks. I'm going to go in the red ocean. I know there's other competitors, but I think that I can look at it a little bit differently I can make it cheaper out of plastic. Uh, I can make it more fun because it, when I do that, I can, I can uh, use different colors and maybe slightly different shapes. So you can, you can jump into the water. You can look at things already out there. They're already out there and just look at one at a time and say, I can play in that space. There's ways that you can tweak the model and begin to be innovative. Then you can take this idea you know, way out there if you want to and say, well, you know, it really is about form over function and you want people to feel creative when they're clipping things together. So there's people that put out paper clips that got, you know, sort of really creative. And then at some point we realized there was a person that said, you know, when we clip papers together, a lot of times it's not two pieces of paper. It's a note to a, to a piece of paper and you have this paper clip. So, there's a whole new way of thinking about that. Notice that the number four went to blue, okay, because now we're back into a blue ocean. No competition, a whole different uh, pattern and way of thinking with the post-it note. And of course, you know what happened after that came out? Someone thought, I can play in that space. I can uh, pay, pay some money towards the patent and, get, and play in that space and see how creative I can get. But I want to just show you, uh, people get stuck on this idea of thought leadership, innovation, new models. Who can do that? We all can. We, we can take every single product that's out there and find one thing that we can tweak and start to play in that space and then begin the process. So another shout it out. Help me out, please. The answer is going to be yes or no for uh, this question. 
the inventor of the three imposed a note was initially told this by his manager. This year, you will get a big bonus. No. Wow, everyone said no. That's not good. How, okay, it's probably this one. Great job. Your work has earned you a promotion. No, no one, that one. This guy, he's not getting any love, is he? Okay. How about this one? We make glues that stick. Stop playing with glues that don't stick. Isn't that sad that that's what happens and uh, everyone seems to know that? Yeah, that's, um, that's the feedback. So <laughs> a quick summary. All right, uh, be aware of the underlying models behind your current activities. Expect to find resistance to a new way of thinking. And you can start with red, o innovation, uh, red ocean innovation ideas, okay? All right, moving right along. We're up to number four. The culture encourages questioning skills. People think of a question as that little squiggly line at the end of the sentence, but there's much more to it that's going on there, and it's worth investigating. Be clear when using each. Questions seek data. Here's a question I have. Here's the data. So, example, what time is the meeting tomorrow? Is this a fact, and I just, want, I just want to have a question about that. I'm not questioning it. Or another one, uh, okay, great. Is that Eastern time? Just want to clarify. Now, those questions feel a lot different to the person that's receiving them than, than these, and that's why we, we call them questioning. It seeks the underlying meeting. So, are you sure I'm the right person to attend? Notice how many question marks we have by this one. You ever see a question that's got a lot of question marks behind it? Uh, that's, that's probably questioning and not just a question. There's a, there's a hint there. It's, it's the underlying model uh, of thinking that, you're, that you have a question about. Or this one. Okay, I'm willing to travel, but you know, can we meet online? Like the whole way of thinking about it is is uh, something that's in question. Now here's another uh, way of thinking about questions and it's, it's about whether or not the question is from curiosity or if the question is from conviction. So a question from curiosity, are you considering hiring consultants for this work? And a question from conviction would sound like, uh, don't you think we should go with consultant X? So. You can say, hey, we, uh, you know, we had a good uh, dialogue, we asked questions. Yeah, but if they were all questions from conviction, um, that's, that's not really you know, an open dialogue with, with uh, uh, questions from curiosity. Now, um, note that curiosity is sometimes equated with having an open mind and conviction with a uh, closed mind. But what, what we have to understand, what's really happening here is that um, curiosity is seeking truth and conviction is seeking confirmation. And, and a lot of times we find that uh, we spend a lot of time to be s safe and feel you know, that it's safe, that we're, we're looking, we're asking questions, but it's, it's driving this. We're, we want to get a confirmation that my thinking is in, in line with your thinking, right? So then we must be right. And I'll go find enough people to tell me that and we'll feel really good about that. And maybe what I should be doing is bouncing it off of some people that might tell me that uh, there's some more thinking that, that I need to do. So a quick summary here, be clear about when asking a question uh, uh, or questioning. Be clear about when asking a question from curiosity or conviction. And knowledge sharing sessions should include questioning. We always have uh, knowledge sharing sessions for the sake of KM in our organizations. And when we look at those, uh, we always ask, so what is the structure that should be in place when we do that? We just, is it any different than just two people meeting and talking? What's, what's some structure that we should give people around knowledge sharing sessions. Any of you have kids that have gone to the zoo? So you could send them to the zoo and just say, go look at everything. Or you can get, send them with a checklist, okay? Tell me what you know, this uh, animal does. Tell me what this animal looks like. And you give them some structure about going off uh, and doing something. So one of the questions that we look at as far as how to, uh, from a KM organization standpoint, how should we tell the organization to engage in knowledge sharing? And what are some, some best practices around some things to include? And this is one of them, which is, um, you know, what questions did you ask? Did it involve questioning? And then encouraging questions can help organizations in reaching thought leadership. 
Okay, we are up to number five. The organization supports all four learner types. So it starts with this. We just saw this earlier. We, we know what double loop learning is. Uh, the only thing different that you'll notice here is that the labels have been changed. So uh, it really is not that instructional to say single loop when I can see it's single loop and double loop when it's double loop. What I want to know is what's flowing through the pipe. You ever, you ever go to a construction site maybe where you can actually see this, the, the pipes and there might be an arrow on it that says steam or something and you can tell what's flowing through that pipe. That's what we really want to know. So here's an outcome. Something's happened and there's a pipe here. And what's flowing through this pipe is productive feedback, productive learning. And an analyst would look at that and say, okay, well, I thought it would be this. Let me tweak this, and I'll, I'll see if I can get that. Now, in this pipe is inventive thinking, inventive feedback. It's coming out of the exact same box, but an inventor is looking at it and thinking, how does that affect the way I'm thinking about the best model for this? So when we, when we look at these two terms and say, this is actually what's flowing, the thinking and learning that's more productive versus inventive relating to the model, what happens in, in real life is if this is one person, as I, as I slow down on this and start spending time thinking about the model, well, what happens? Our inventive time increases and our productive time decreases. Okay, now if I'm at work and my productive time decreases, what happens to me? Not good. Because they, because you know, HR or my boss might say, you know, your your numbers were this last month, and now they're this. What happened? And of course, when you explain, just like the inventor of the 3M note, oh, you see, I'm working on this brand new idea. It's going to be the best money maker for the company. I haven't quite figured it out yet, but it's going to be really cool. Your manager goes, okay, good, keep doing that. Right? Is that that's probably not how the conversation goes. So what what happens when you're Thinking about inventive ideas, uh, a lot of people tell me, if I was given a, a presentation and, and this woman said, no, I've, I did both at the same time. And after we had a conversation, she said, well, actually, you're right. I, I, I was working on this new spreadsheet uh, code uh, on, the, on Saturdays and didn't tell anyone until I got it working. So there's ways that we hide it. Okay, and I still got my work done, but I did some extra work, and then I rolled it out and showed people, and it was really cool because I did stuff faster. So there is a give and take in the time. And when you understand that, that these two things happen uh, in the organization uh, with this relationship, that relationship looks like this. It ends up being the learning S-curve. So I begin developing as an expert. I'm getting more and more productive. And at some point, I start to question, maybe there's a better way to do that. And I start to think about the model. Well, I begin to become a little less productive as I become more inventive and move into this box called the pioneer box and then hopefully at some point emerge as highly inventive and productive as the thought leader. And as it says, uh, becoming a thought leader usually requires some time as a pioneer. Everyone wants to escape this. I hear a lot of people when I give this presentation say, I really want to just go straight up. I'm the expert and now I'm the thought leader. And I, and, and I don't want to deal with this pioneer. Why do you think people don't want to be a pioneer? There's a term that we use related to this. Is also it's known as sort of a fear area. There's, there's a fear of this box. Why do, you, why do you suppose we call it that? The pioneers are the ones with the arrows in their back. The pioneers, <laughs> literally from the movies, the pioneers are the ones with the arrows in their back. Very visual, yes. People are afraid to fail. They have to fail a lot in the pioneer area. People are afraid to fail. We'll get to that term in a little while. Uh, you're right, and we're afraid to fail. But there's some what people, some people call failing, uh, in the pioneer box. Excellent. Any other, any other thoughts? These are good. One more, yes. Criticism. Criticism. Sure. If you don't have that trusted uh, learning partner to say that's a good idea, but why don't you work on it a little more before you tell anyone else? Uh, you know, then you could get criticized. Yes. You know, when I see pioneer, I'm thinking it's the part that you just don't know that goes beyond the expert, but, you're, but it's required to get you the thought leader. And so it is the most, you know, ambiguous. Ambiguous. You have no idea. You know, you probably right. don't even know if you get there. So 
you just assume that somehow miraculously you can wake up one day and go, okay, yesterday I was an expert, now I'm a thought leader, but because you don't know what's in Pioneer. You don't know. That's excellent. That's exactly right. There's a lot of questions there. So there's a lot of fear, and so far we've been mentioning them from the standpoint in the, uh, the person in the role. Um, this expert, this is the person who has the answer, okay? They're seen as that label. They have the answer. That gives them authority. Guess what happens when you have the answer and the authority because you know. You start talking like this. And when you talk like this, you're in line for leadership. <laughs> now, this same person goes over here, and he's asked in a meeting, how's that coming along, that work that you're working on? Um, well, we tried three things, and uh, we're not sure if the fourth one's going to work, but we think it's going to. I mean, who gets promoted talking like that? <laughs> that but, because that's your, it's, yeah, because you're, we're trying some things. We think we're onto something. It sounds completely different. So there's a fear for this person. There's also a fear for the organization because HR loves to measure us. I know how to measure. I can measure from novice to expert. I can put a whole development and plan for my entire organization built around that. And now you're telling me that you want to go off and try something, and you tried three things last month and none of them worked. And how, is that good or bad? I don't know how to measure that. And as a control freak in HR, I don't like that. So I have a fear around the organization's not sure how to measure and report on anything. But that is exactly what needs to happen. Uh, we need to go through that to reach a thought leader. Now, there's variations of, of this. This is the one we looked at, a standard S-curve. In summary, a normal learning pattern. As a normal learning pattern, OK, I'll say that again. It's the normal learning pattern. It's not what HR tells us, novice to expert. The normal learning pattern is you eventually knowledge, eventually knowledge in the current system creates some questioning. Pioneers are supported or leave to become an entrepreneur. That's how it works because the organization is not supporting the normal learning pattern. There's the sweeping S-curve with an entrenched expert. See, we went too far. Now I've been there for years and years, and I know every nuance of this system that's about to be replaced. Used to being the person with the answers needs to be OK with confidence in the questions, not the answers, and may not be able to make the turn. Do you know any of those people? Maybe we're some of those. Maybe at certain times in our career, we've been some of those people. And then this is the other variation, the narrow S-curve. The overnight success. I call it the bumblebee. Have you heard the story about the bumblebee? The scientists have measured the bumblebee, the size, the mass, the weight, the wingspan. And they've determined that the bumblebee should not actually be able to fly. Do you know why the bumblebee can fly? It has not read the research that says <laughs> that it should not be able to fly. <coughs> Unaware of entrenched thinking. So a novice can come in to our organization and immediately start to say, yeah, I, I haven't been here 10 years in that entrenched thinking, but I was somewhere else and we did something like that. It may rely on existing knowledge to use an analogy. So. My point is, view each novice as a possible bumblebee. We don't describe novices that way. A novice is that someone comes in, and the first week we'll show them where the coffee is. They don't know anything. That's the way we think about novices. In an organization that values thought leaders, it also starts to value novices, the bumblebee, the fresh eyes. Someone coming in saying, wow, why are you doing it this way? And we always have, from an HR standpoint, an exit interview. OK, you've been here so long, you're leaving. Tell me why and what you think. Why, why are you doing it then? It's too late, they're gone. Why don't we have an entry interview six months in? Tell me what you think. You have fresh eyes. Why don't we start valuing the novices and helping the organization take shortcuts 
uh, by learning from some other ideas that, that uh, is against our entrenched thinking. So we, it, we start to think of not only thought leadership a little differently, but also novices. So we have four different learner types that need to be supported differently. A novice, for the novice, it says developing a novice typically involves onboarding training and access to best practice materials, clear expectations for performance. So we kind of know that one. An expert. Developing an expert requires attending and speaking at targeted conferences, time and recognitions for problem solve, access to problem solving tools. But here's where it's different. This is what people always do, and they stop there. Developing a pioneer requires attending and speaking at broader conferences, recognition for discoveries, access to creativity tools, also requires allowing for pioneer time. We just call it that, pioneering time. How many of you have heard of the term sabbatical? Okay, it's an old term, an ancient term. People that have worked for a long time, maybe their whole career, and at some point they're given some time to go off and think. Okay, it's not a vacation. It's actually part of the natural learning process at some point to go uh, take an expert and say, go think about everything you know about this field and see if there's another model. Okay? It was sort of built in, and we've forgotten that over the ages. Or um, in some organizations, you hear, you hear maybe Google or some places, they have Friday afternoons, or I've worked with some organizations, they'll say, okay, for one hour every two weeks, we stop and talk about if we can do things better or differently. But you start to build it in and structure what you do at work around learning, because learning is the fundamental thing that's happening at work. You are a learning organization just with some learning disabilities. So you start to allow for it and build some things in. Notice this also says broader conferences. So, you know, one example I have on that is um, you've all heard of Southwest Airlines. So when Southwest Airlines was brand new, all the other airline companies were not making a lot of money. Southwest came along and started making money, and they're like, who's the new kid on the block? Who's the bumblebee? What, what do they know that we don't know? And they started asking, you know, how did you come up with a model that makes money? And they said, well, we talked to some guy at NASCAR. NASCAR? I thought that was cars going around a track. What do they know about flying airplanes? Well, they ran into someone who says, you know how we win the race is we, uh, we have a, a pit where you can, in less than five seconds, we can change all four tires and gas up the car and even uh, clean the windshield. Because you don't win the race when you're sitting still. You win the race when you're out on the track. And we thought from that, Airline businesses don't make money when the airplane's sitting on the ground. And so everything, that, everything around the business model uh, for Southwest became this idea that says, how do we turn the plane around quicker than everybody else? And that, that fed into every decision made about the number of planes that they own, the number of planes they need to train people on, the number of planes that they have um, uh, people involved in maintenance, the number of parts that they need. Everything around that, number of things you have to know, does it come up to the gate and stop here or back here? Everything was built around this idea. So we had a bumblebee come along and go from novice to thought leader because they talked to someone completely outside of the current thinking. The problem is in our organizations, if you're a manager and a person comes to you and says, I want to attend a conference and it's on XYZ, totally outside of what we do. Are you going to sign off on that when someone asks you, you spent the money to send this person to a conference like that? Would you defend that decision? This is where it actually hits the wall. This is where we stop and don't have thought leaders and learning cultures because, we, we're, because of that fear. And then finally, thought leaders. So developing a thought leader requires presenting at broad conferences and finding additional uses for their ideas. Uh, so organizations also need to lead with language. We use the same language over and over. We need to get used to failing. We need to tell people it's good to fail. That hasn't been effective. And the reason is that's not what they're doing. If you mess up in a productive environment, that's failing. But when you're a pioneer, those are called learnings. It's an entirely different thing happening. And we need to get our language right around moving from uh, not just novice to expert, but uh, pioneer and thought leader. There's different terms that describe what's going on there. And 
I always go back to the 1950s organization chart. The 1950s organization chart started with two boxes at the top, operations and R&D. It was kind of cool because you knew it was a learning organization right from the top. You had one group focused on productive thinking, get it done faster. You knew what the kind of thinking was. You knew what the leadership sounded like, transactional leadership versus transformational. And you had a group involved in R&D, research and development. And you had an idea what risk taking was and what the transformational leadership was, what kind of thinking was happening there, that there was trial and error, you know what was happening there. And some people had the luxury of spending a 20 year career in one box or the other. Today's leadership, today's organizations have to do both. They have to balance both. And they've never been told how to do it or this is actually what's happening. Some of the organization charts today I look at and I think Dr. Seuss created them. I, they're, they're so far away from the fundamental of what's happening in the organization. Okay, so quick summary on this section. There are four learner types, novice, expert, pioneer, thought leader. Different types of support needed for each. Pioneering involves risk taking and so does not pioneering. We always think it's safe, right? I'm gonna stay where I'm at because that, that's taking a risk to go out there. And we forget this point. It's also risky not to pioneer. It's also risky to say, oh, I'm safe here. Really? Not in this day and age. And knowledge sharing sessions, again, we drive knowledge sharing sessions from a KM standpoint in the organization. And we just say, here, go share knowledge. But they should include not, not only what we know and what we're doing, but also what we are trying. What are we trying? What are we thinking about that we don't know if it'll work? Are we sharing those ideas in knowledge sharing sessions? And this word trying, another quote in my book, we learn by trying, not by doing. Because you may have heard in the KM field this quote that's been around several decades, we learn by doing. We don't learn by doing. There's a lot of research around it. In fact, we, get, we regress if we're just doing what we've been doing. It may look the same. It was a quote that came, we got it from an a, uh, economist that was watching a, a factory and people were, they were learning and doing something different. He saw them doing it and said, we learn by doing. It's not what's happening. It may look like they were doing, what they were doing was trying. It's a different thing going on. So we have to be careful about our words again. We learn by trying, not by doing. And think about when it is that we are doing and when we are trying. Okay, um, so quick summary, five key principles that we hit today. Teams work in learning organizations. Leaders separate dialogue from directives. Individuals operate within double loop learning. The culture encourages questioning skills and the organization supports all four learner types. But what are the key takeaways? What are the key things we should think about? They start with two questions that drive, that drive this. The first was, why create thought leaders? Why should we create thought leaders? If you haven't been keeping track of this, generalized robotics will own expert knowledge. The workforce of the future will belong to organizations that create thought leaders, not just experts. How do we create thought leaders? Adopt the learning S-curve as the organization's fundamental model, that what you're doing in the organization's learning, and it looks like this. It doesn't stop at expert. Develop people beyond the inflection point is how we do it. What is, what is an inflection point? In mathematics, there's a term for this point called the inflection point, defined in math as the turning point for change. And it's the same of, of this learning S-curve, the same thing. It's the point in time when we let go of the current model, even though we don't know exactly what the next one is. It's the point in time when we stop holding on to what we know and start valuing the right question, not just the right knowledge. And it's, it's the point in time when we stop developing from novice to expert and start creating thought leaders. So that's my presentation today. Thank you for your participation. And I'll take any questions. Yes. Slide 31, could you say a little bit more about the distinction you're making between failing and learning? And I ask because in my head I'm thinking, isn't all failure an opportunity to learn? Okay. Uh, people have a fear, a fear of failure. And the way that we have um, tried to approach 
that is to tell them, get over it. And what I'm suggesting is there's actually something else going on when we're a pioneer, and we should use a, a more appropriate term of what's actually going on rather than calling it something that it's not and tell people to get over it. The learnings are different than failures okay. at, that, at that point. Okay, does that, does that help? Okay, good. Really good question. Any, any other questions? Yes? Um, in, in your initial stuff, you were talking about the continuum between directive and, and dialogue. Yes. And you talked about what goes wrong when you've got too much directive. What happens if you don't have enough? If you don't have enough directive? Yeah. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure I made the point that you're always going to have both. It's good to have both. Um, the point is, if you want a learning culture that's developing thought leaders, um, you have to be very clear which forum you're in. And, and the only place that you can place blame when that's not happening is leadership. Leadership uh, usually is at fault for not being clear enough to say, OK, I've heard enough, and now we're going to do this. And make sure that they never come back and say, OK, I remember in the meeting that you actually had a different idea and it was different than mine, and you th made it seem like my idea wasn't very good. Uh, and so somehow you're going to feel like a decision made later on about you or your career was affected by that. Uh, so they have to be completely separate, not just in, the, in, to say, in saying, well, now we're in this one or this one. They have to be completely separate from any actions that happen because of an idea that, that you may have. When I've defined it as the leader, as dialogue, because you could tell me my idea is crazy in dialogue. But when I say, OK, I appreciate the feedback. I'll think about it some more. But the next day when I say, all right, here's what we're going to do, then we're, we're in a completely different situation. And, uh, and what uh, your comment or anyone else's about my idea when we were in the dialogue needs to be completely separate from what we're doing now going forward. It can never come back. And you feel like it comes back that you had an idea that was shut down or some retribution happened from it. You had completely separate things. And leadership usually is not. Uh, that good at making sure that they're being that transparent, uh, that transparent about when they're in and which one, and that nothing is connected between the two. And if you don't do that, people shut down because they're not offering ideas uh, in that that type of environment. Okay. Any 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 other questions? Yes. Um, so you talk about learning partners. Um, is there a do you have a prescriptive way for to identify learning partners or you know, certain key characteristics that you should? You know? That's a great that's a great question. Um, there's you know one of the things you want in a learning partner is someone you trust. I mean that's the first thing you want a sounding board. Sure, someone that knows enough about the topic than you. I mean it's not your grandmother. Like that's a great idea. You know it's someone who might be a little more critical. Um, but someone mainly that you trust because you don't want them to go, oh, you know what, you're not going to believe what John just came up with. I mean, what a crazy idea. It, the, the whole point of it is that it's a sounding board that's trusted. Uh, th the next thing I would say is it's not someone exactly like you. So, you know, we, we said Wozniak, if you really look at Wozniak and you look at Steve Jobs, you go, these are really two different people, very different, we come from different ways of thinking. So uh, that's a great question, and uh, that, those would be my uh, recommendations. Good, thank you.